Since September the 11th and the war against terror, Britain's mosques are headline news. From Croydon to Finsbury Park, Leicester to Tipton, those who control mosques have become the center of public interest. Tonight, growing numbers of British Muslims reveal why they're no longer prepared to tolerate imams and mosque committees who betray their trust. Finsbury Park Mosque in North London has become notorious for its links to terrorism. The mosque has been connected to kidnappers in Yemen, the Brixton Shoe Bomber, and British Taliban fighters currently held in Cuba. At the center of the controversy is Abu Hamza, vocal supporter of Osama bin Laden. When another plane goes down now, is it a Lockerbie? Or an SOS net. But it's the way he was able to take over the mosque and impose his own hardline views that has given most cause for concern amongst other Muslims. The idea is to slow down and make the sky very high risk for anybody who flies. This sort of approach is very enormously damaging to the reputation of Islam and Muslim community in the UK. I mean, they are using Islam as a tool. They have hijacked the uh, holy verses for their own political agenda. Really. Abu Hamza's political activities also reveal a flawed system where one man can forcibly take control of a mosque at the expense of the regular worshippers. Mufti Barkatullah is a trustee of the mosque. Officially, he's supposed to oversee what goes on there, but he's actually too scared to go inside. I'm completely powerless because I fear when I go that someone will intimidate me or someone will challenge me and put me in awkward position and without any provocation they will abuse me verbally and sometimes physically if they can. When Finsbury Park Mosque opened in 1985, it was the pride of the community supported by Prince Charles and nearly a million pounds from the Saudi royal family. But within five years, the mosque was in trouble. Civil war had broken out on the committee. So strange as it now seems, the charismatic Abu Hamza was invited to sort things out. He came as a go-between, but uh, he gradually elevated himself to the lord and king of the mosque. Hamza came to the mosque as an employee of the trustees, but soon imposed his own authority. The trustees, they could no longer communicate, meet, or do any decision. So as soon as the, the board collapsed, Abu Hamza took every single control in the mosque. It wasn't long before Hamza was using his influence to promote a holy war on the West. Alarmed, the trustees, as guarantors of the mosque's integrity, tried to challenge the way Hamza was running things with a court injunction. It only made things worse. At that point, Abu Hamza became the extremely violent. As a result of injunction, uh, I tried to take the regular imam to install him in Friday. We were all bundled out of the mosque by force. The trustees can't afford to go back to court, so they're stuck with the status quo. It's unclear who's legally in charge here, but in reality, Abu Hamza controls the mosque. I mean, since that time, he has been, uh, you know, behaving differently. He's sometimes threatening the trust, holding them as a hostage, sometimes being very conciliatory. With no outside religious body able to impose order, the mosque has fallen into disrepair, a far cry from its lavish beginnings. 
the building is running down as a derelict and the level of services and the facilities are going down and it's smelly and filthy mosque. The pulpit has such a magic and the imam from the pulpit can influence the community in many respects uh, which need to be supervised, needs to be controlled. Dr. Badawi heads Britain's leading Muslim legal authority. He says control isn't as straightforward as in the church. We don't have a clergy. We don't have a sort of a structure like a church. You know, all mosques are equal. All imams are independent. So without a governing body running British mosques, disputes can simply go on and on, as Muslims in Luton have found to their cost. Today's prayer meeting followed the troubles last night when supporters of the Imam tried to break into the building. Extra police had been drafted to the troubled mosque after a judge ordered them... In 1992, the Muslim community of Luton hit the media spotlight when there was a standoff between the Imam and the mosque committee. We were laughed at by, by other members of uh, the community, and rightly so. We had built this massive uh, place. We had uh, a big uh, center up the road, and still some of us were praying inside and some were, uh, were playing outside, making a spectacle of ourselves. Luton's first Muslim migrants arrived in the 50s and 60s, when men like Akbar Khan came from the Kashmiri region of Pakistan. Luton was an attractive place to come to work because everybody who came over uh, knew someone down here, very close to the airport, and Vauxhall provided very good uh, wage packet at the end of the week. After a stint at Vauxhall's and the post office, Khan turned to taxi driving. Like many others, his plan wasn't always to stay. We will work for a while, earn some money, come back, set up a business, build a house, and uh, get on uh, uh, with life back in Azad Kashmir. Those early migrants kept in touch with the old country and each other through their religion. They clubbed together and bought a terraced house, and then another, and finally a third. When families joined the men in the mid-70s, the community decided it was time for a more permanent solution. They started to raise money to build a purpose-built mosque and community center. It's a working class community where people would save 50 pounds at the end of the, of the, of the week. And out of those um, 50, perhaps 15 or 20 would go towards the mass project and the project up the road. The mosque appointed an imam to guide the community and help coordinate support for the mosque project. As the figurehead of a million pound project, Imam Abdul Chisti developed a loyal following and huge personal authority. People virtually gave money to him, trusting that he is the man, whatever is coming out of his mouth is, uh, is truth. Building began in 1982, and to keep some continuity, the mosque committee decided to postpone elections and stay on beyond their allotted two years. But within another year, things started to turn sour. When people would like to ask questions about running of the mosque, about the funds, and about when elections would be held, uh, they would they would not get any any answer out of uh, out of that management committee or for that matter the, the the imam who was very much the linchpin of the 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 whole thing akbar khan wasn't alone in his concern about the power wielded by the imam mr jishti was himself manager he was himself imam he was himself trustees and everything he was controlling himself the Trust say Mr. Chisty has had no management role at any time and that the decision to become a Trust was taken by a properly constituted AGM, so members see it otherwise. 
And then it dawned upon us and th that look, there are no elections, there is this trust, trust for life. These people are owners for life, managers for life. The mosque was finally completed in 1985. But with Chisti's strong religious influence, challenging the Imam or the committee was a risky business. I remember in the 1990, the month of Ramadan, it was a Friday prayer. There was a, more than a thousand people in the mosque when I raised this question and I said, from last 10 years, there is no accountability, there is no election, and I feel strongly there's something wrong going on. His supporters come and try to fight me, and there was a number of occasions it happens. People would uh, stand up from various corners and shout us down and threaten us with, uh, with, with violence. <laughs> One occasion in Friday, we had a fight in the, in the mosque, no doubt, in the mosque downstairs the hall. It was a harrowing experience. We were, we were treated like criminals and uh, vagabonds. How dare we challenge uh, them, uh, righteous uh, people? How dare we stand up uh, in, uh, in the mosque on a Friday? Akbar and Muhammad Stand began slowly to gain the support of other members. By May 1992, 700 of them decided they'd had enough. They elected a new committee to run the mosque, which then tried to find a way of working with the imam. We did request him that, look, we have got this total support of the Muslim community, and we won the election, and we wanted to run a proper, within proper constitutions. His reply was, uh, no, he is not willing to um, recognize these elections, uh, and um, he's not willing to work with us. So next day, we simply physically removed them from the mosque. But Imam Chisti wasn't about to go quietly. The Imam, ousted from the central mosque, led lunchtime prayers in the car park while his opponents held a service inside. I think that now we have tried our best and they don't want, and I think let's decide the court what is going to happen. The group of 15 people who have been holding power for all these years are accountable to none. Imam Chisti refused to back down and took his battle to the High Court in London. With no higher religious authority to turn to, the two sides fought it out for another five years at a cost to the community of £100,000. As a result of the, that terrible exercise and a lot of expense and a lot of grief and a lot of anxieties uh, which the community has gone through, we have uh, um, this constitution uh, where hopefully nobody will be able to impose uh, themselves either in form of a person or in, in form of a group of people to, to, uh, to govern the affairs of the mosque to the exclusion of others. In 1997, the High Court ruled that Luton Moss should hold regular elections and organize a set of rules to limit the power of the imam and committee over the membership. The whole idea of the mosque, it should be a balance between the religious authority, that is the imam, and what we might call the administrative authority, that is the council. One of the first jobs of the new council or committee was to ensure that donations were properly accounted for. And although the court ruled that those in charge of the mosque before 1992 should hand over accounts, none have yet appeared. So no one knows how much money was raised or spent. We don't have any idea. And the community at large um, doesn't have any idea as to what happened to that money and how that money was uh, spent. Mr. Chisti still runs a community center built whilst he was in charge of the mosque. A spokesman for Mr. Chisti said the facility was open to anyone who applied to the committee, but some local Muslims feel excluded. He is the chief trustee, and uh, he enjoys so much power. The community is by and large ex excluding, ex excluded from using uh, that, uh, that place. We've been trusting him, he's a mom, he's 
leading a prayers, he's teaching our children, he's performing other Islamic duties, but he betrayed us very badly. British Muslims can find themselves powerless if their Imam decides to behave badly and simply ignore his congregation. But abuse of office can be even more difficult to control in the small local mosques. Islam has more regular worshippers than any other religion in Britain. Every week, a new mosque is opened. One of the five pillars of the faith is to give willingly to charity, and this often means the mosque. Congregations put a huge amount of trust in the integrity of the imam and the mosque committee. Like many new migrants, the Bangladeshi community in Bow, East London, had long wanted their own place of worship. Somewhere local, so worshippers like Arzu Mia wouldn't have to make the four-mile round trip to the main East London mosque in Whitechapel. There was no place to pray, no place where kids could learn in our mother tongue, and no Islamic lessons. Father of four, Hussein Lilas, also wanted a place to meet the growing community's cultural needs. There was no mosque, no place for mostly Asian people and Bangladeshi people. There is no cultural center. There is nothing for our people. Three years ago, the community believed they'd found a solution through a local imam. A respected barrister and former judge in Bangladesh Kutubuddin Shikta proposed a new place of worship. We know from our elders, he's a good man, he's a scholar, he's a literate man. And that's where we give him a hand for a place for ourselves and our religion. The community were told that a former local pub could be leased and turned into a mosque. Their unconditional trust in the Imam meant there was no reason to question his motives. We were happy, very much happy, and gave everything. We spared our time, we spared our money, even our help as well. Azumir had a severe kidney condition and survived on benefits, but he believed it was important to make sacrifices for the mosque. Even though some of us were on benefits, we saved money and gave it to the mosque. What people couldn't give in money, they gave in time and practical help. He's a kidney patient, but he spent his more than one year's time down the 
uh, basement to make, to stop the water coming through the walls. After months of hard work and donations totaling at least 75,000 pounds, the mosque was opened in December 1998. Imam Shikta's fundraising sermons went into overdrive. Azumir was himself held up as the model donor and promised eternal happiness. In early 2000, it was suggested that the only way to secure the community's investment would be to buy the freehold from the owner at an asking price of 430,000 pounds. The price came through our scholar, Barrister Kutubuddin Sikdar. We believe him, still we believe him. Imam Shikta told his congregation they had to move quickly. So the fundraising started up again, this time with a new gimmick. 300 pounds brought you a special prayer plot. There is a list of uh, 136 people who gave 300 pound each and more than that, minimum 300 pound, and all the money is initial by Mr. Kutubuddin Ahmed Shikdar. When we start going people, the donors, they start ask, questioning us. The 430,000 pound, it's not a matter of job. It's a lot of, lot of money. Is it worth it? Imam Shikta told us that he was approached to purchase the premises and took professional advice which resulted in the asking price. However, some members of the community sought an independent survey which said it was worth no more than £160,000. Concerned about the discrepancy, they confronted the Imam. When we asked him to meet the real owner of this property, he excused and he denied different way. The group checked the land registry to approach the owner directly. There was a big surprise in store. We found, according to land registry, the 246 borrowed, this property's legal proprietor owner, Mr. Kutubuddin Shikdar himself, and he was pulling cover on our eyes and our faith and our belief. It turned out that in 1998, Mr. Schichter had bought the old pub for 95,000 pounds, a quarter of what he was now trying to sell it back to his congregation for. Feeling they had nowhere else to turn, worshippers clubbed together to pay for the advice of a solicitor. The first question I asked when they came to me was, well, where's the constitution? Where's the trust deed? Where's the copies of the authorities and minutes of meetings and so on, which gives people authority to do things? And they didn't have them. And they said that there had been discussions about producing a constitution. And Mr. Schichter was dealing with it. We are in the situation at the moment. We are hopeless. We have only for crying and uh, shouting help, help. Nobody is raising hand to help us because people are scared he is a barrister. In Mr. Schichter's response to the solicitor, his tone appeared to show a barely veiled contempt for his congregation. The only reply I got was an acknowledgement, which uh, was a short letter saying, I'm going to see solicitors, um, by the way. These people are not very rich, so please make sure they've got the money to pay the costs that they're going to have to pay when I uh, sue them for defamation. Mr. Schichter remains an imam at the Bow Mosque and still owns the building. He told us that the donations of those that complained were returned to them. Some were, but Azu Mir always maintained that his donations were not. He's lied to us and deceived us. And those who lie and deceive, you cannot pray behind them. He leaves the prayers on Friday, and we can't pray behind him. 
Although Shikta maintains he's done no wrong and the complainants were troublemakers, Arzu Mir was once again forced to make the four mile round trip to the Whitechapel Mosque until his death in November last year. Again, the local community found it had nowhere to turn when its religious leader had misled them. In Britain, scandals have forced other major religions to monitor their priests more closely. Some believe British Islam is now facing a similar challenge. Most of our communities come from countries where power is taken by the rich or the powerful. Some of our imams do not fulfill the role effectively. Um, this due to a lack of knowledge of English, a lack of understanding of the new society because they are Im imported from elsewhere. At the Muslim College in London, Sheikh Zaki Badawi is attempting to make imams practicing in Britain more culturally sensitive to our society. Now, the idea of the college itself is to try to bring imams who are homegrown, who are brought up here, or who really are trained here to have a, a broader view of Islam. She, in her own, with her own free will, forgoes making. We hope that in the next few years, we'll have young people brought up here who know the system here, who understand the society here, who understand the culture here, and you will have the mosques transformed altogether. But for now, demand is such that the mosques take who they can. The city of Bradford has over 50 mosques, and there's a constant shortage of qualified imams. They're required to lead prayer, but also to provide Quranic education to Muslim children. Many of the imams currently working in Britain in mosques are from, from abroad. It's very, very difficult to, to recruit imam locally. Um, so when, where, whenever you come across someone who is in a position to offer their service, you tend to grab them with both arms, really. There isn't any stringent test to recruit the best person for the job. And that's a major problem. The Home Office have made it easy for imams and other ministers of religion to live in this country. They're exempt from the usual visa requirements and only need to supply an imam's certificate of training and an offer of employment at a British mosque. This is exactly how Imam Muhammad Amjad came to Britain from Pakistan in 1996 to take up duties as a Quranic teacher. In 1999, police received a complaint from a local family about Amjad's behavior while he was teaching their 10-year-old daughter at this mosque in Bradford. Police recorded the young girl's statement on video, and it was during this session that a picture began to emerge of what had taken place during the Quranic lessons. The children had gone as normal to the mosque in a group and had been having the teaching for that particular day um, and then he tapped on the little girl's shoulder and said that she had to go up and see him um, in his office that he was using as like an office and bedroom. It was in this room that Amjad sexually assaulted the young girl. I don't think he's good, because he should be teaching us, not taking us to the room and that. And if he's teaching us about things, why can't other people teach us? Like, at least they won't touch your body and that. And he touches your body, and I don't like it. When the little girl had gone up there, and he'd interfered with her, he'd intimated that next time when she came to the bedroom, he would show her how to do other things. That scared her sufficiently to be able to go to her mum and dad that night and um, confide in them. As the investigation progressed, another parent from the mosque came forward. Amjad had also sexually assaulted their son. What reaction did you get from the mosque committee itself? Um, very ri little, really, because they wanted to keep it all very hush-hush. Um, and obviously they wanted to protect their, their own reputation as well. 
I think it's a minority community who's trying to protect its own integrity and credibility and, and wants to safeguard kind of its image, its image. And therefore, there's a tendency for it to be say, OK, we will deal with things in-house, uh, within our homes. Uh, and, and these are issues which we need to be concerned about. And the rest of the society needs to really stay out of it. The independence of each mosque and imam means there are no formal guidelines, no rules and regulations to protect children at risk, no one to appeal to if a parent suspects something is wrong. As the court date approached, a petition supporting Imam Amjad was circulated on mosque-headed paper. We the undersigned indicate our support for Hafiz Muhammad Naim Amjad and wish him to return to his employment with the mosque as soon as he is able after conclusion of his court case. He is a respected and holy person and we have every confidence in his abilities as a priest. The parents of Amjad's victims were under enormous pressure not to go through with the court case. Once the date was arranged, because of the pressure that had been put on the family, the father came forward and didn't want her to go to court. They're obviously very concerned, especially where the girl's involved, of her future life, and it, they worry that it may affect their prospects of marriage in years to come. But in the end, the families did have the courage to go to court. Amjad was convicted of one count of indecent assault and an act of gross indecency. While he was awaiting sentencing, the mosque circulated letters and a second petition in support of their disgraced imam. We, the undersigned, indicate our continued support for Mr. Hafiz Muhammad. While we regret the circumstances which led to his recent conviction for offenses concerning we nevertheless confirm that if he is allowed his liberty, we will have no objection to him being employed by the mosque. Despite their plea, Amjad was sentenced to three years in prison in February 2000, and on his release, immediately deported. I think the Muslim community needs to wake up. Although you'll find people condemning such action, but you won't find many committee or, or mosque organization has taken any practical step to ensure the children under their care are adequately protected. The Bradford Council of Mosques is attempting to get its members to adopt a set of government guidelines to protect children in their care. But these guidelines are not compulsory and so aren't about to threaten a culture of secrecy that surrounds even some of Britain's largest mosques. Secrecy that has devastating results for ordinary Muslim families.
Glasgow has over 40,000 Muslims, most of whom were born in Scotland. But as elsewhere in Britain, the central mosque remains in the hands of the first generation of immigrants. What we actually have is the old guard, the old village cultural systems still exist in present day Scotland and Glasgow. We have to bring in a system which understands the present indigenous system, that understands the land that we stay in. Sajid Hussain is the editor of a local Muslim newspaper who believes Islamic institutions need to adapt with the times. The problem we usually have is when you have these kind of committees that are sitting there for so many years, they tend to be a power among themselves. There's a question of uh, accountability then, who are they responsible to? The older generation has successfully made Glasgow Central Mosque into a respected Scottish institution. But it's when things go wrong that the culture of the mosque is called into question. The first generation that immigrated from here brought with it its own culture. And the culture there is very tribal and caste-ridden. And therefore, they feel sometimes that you must not, you sort of must not defame the tribe. Let the tribe sort its own problems uh, quietly. And don't, uh, let us, let, don't let either everybody knows about us. But in 1998, everybody did get to know about a dramatic event on mosque premises, despite the mosque's best efforts to keep it under wraps. In November that year, a worshipper was praying at the mosque when he was disturbed by a child's cry. I, I heard a child sort of shouting at someone, and the kid was saying, sorry, uncle, I can't take it walked into the room and this guy was lying facing down on the floor. I asked him twice that was wrong and he didn't reply. Then I touched his feet and I asked him, what's wrong with you? And then he stood up and said, saying, no, nothing, it's, there's nothing wrong with me. And while he was standing up, he pulled up the zip of his trouser. And at that stage I thought, no, it's, there's something else as well. When I saw a over his shoulder, there was a young boy who was standing up from the floor, pulling up his trousers. Certain he just witnessed a serious sexual assault, Dr. Farouk grabbed 33-year-old Tahir Din and took him straight to a mosque official. One of the mosque officials, he recognized him immediately, telling me that he knows quite a lot about this guy, and he knows that he has done this thing before in the mosque as well. So don't worry about it, we will handle this case. After insisting Tahir Din should be reported immediately, Dr. Farouk left the mosque authorities to call the police. Later the same day, concerned the police had not yet approached him, Dr. Farouk returned to the mosque, only to discover that nothing had been done. I realized that they are not willing to take this case to the police want to resolve the situation somehow here in their office. Dr. Farouk immediately called the police himself to report the sexual assault on the 10-year-old boy. Once the police investigation got underway, other details began to emerge of previous cases involving Tahir Din on mosque premises. Months before Dr. Farouk caught him, a group of mothers had confronted mosque officials alleging Tahir Din had assaulted a number of their children. Shamshad Akhtar was one of those appalled at what had happened. They say this is a bad name for community if we tell them. They didn't even want to take that further, you know. They didn't even want to involve police. They didn't even want to other community know about it. Tahir Din... He's trying to be, uh, he's a very, very good Muslim, you know. They show him cap on the head, taking the God's name, but doing all the filthy things. We went in first and the main door. We went there and we had the people sitting in now. And they laugh, they didn't listen, saying, calm down. But after that, after you went, after you complained, Tahir Din interfered with another child. He did. 
The mosque denies any attempt to cover up Tawhidin's activities. This is the house of God. If anybody would have known this, they wouldn't have tolerated it, no matter whosoever he was. They didn't know it, and we didn't know his background at all. And it was a news to all of us. And we can categorically deny that, and we'd have no reason why to hide it. Dr. Farouk still maintains that some of those associated with the mosque were keen that the Tahir Din incident didn't tarnish the mosque's good reputation. There was enormous pressure on myself, sort of emotional blackmailing, and there was pressure on my family back home in Pakistan to, they asked my family, my, they approached my dad many times, asked them to ask me not to go ahead with this case and not to testify against Mr. Tahadin. Muhammad Farouk did eventually testify. Tahir Din was charged with sexual offenses against a nine and a 10 year old and convicted in July, 1999. He was sentenced to 12 months in prison and was also placed on the sex offenders register for 10 years. It's very clear there are two different laws being exercised, law of the land and law of the mosque. Mosque officials, they try their best to I mean, do the things in their own ways instead of taking it to the legal authorities or law enforcement agencies. The insidious culture of secrecy that outraged Dr. Farouk in Glasgow can be even more pernicious. It can grip a whole community. That's exactly what happened here in Preston, Lancashire, with terrible consequences for one family who had the courage to confront both the Imam and the management committee. My father hasn't spoken to me for ages. He kept asking why did we take the Imam to court. He felt that our community's reputation could have been saved if we hadn't pursued the court case. But now he feels that all Muslims have been given a bad name and the reputation of mosques has been damaged. On an autumn evening four years ago, the family's seven-year-old daughter returned home from her daily lesson learning the Quran at the local mosque. When my daughter came home from the mosque, she went straight upstairs, washing her hands and crying. She wouldn't eat and she was just constantly washing her hands. She said, Mummy, I need to tell you something. And I said, just be quiet, I'm watching TV. And then she told me. She was upset and crying. And my mind just went. During that day's busy lesson, the religious teacher, Imam Ahmed Halalat, had forced her to masturbate him. The children were in the classroom. They were having lessons being taught by Halalat. And they were actually reading from the Quran at the benches that they have in the classroom. Um, the victim was in the classroom. She was sat at one of the low benches reading from the Quran. Um, and that's when Halalat um, abused her. I never believed priests could be like this or be bad people. I spoke to my husband and said, look, this is what my daughters are saying. And he said, no, it's not, you know, it couldn't be right. We just sat on the bed all night. We just didn't know what to do. We couldn't sleep, just talking it through. We kept asking ourselves, what's happening to us? Why did this happen to us? Later that day, certain their daughter couldn't be making her story up, they reported Ahmed Halalat to the police. A lot of the community were in disbelief. They didn't think that this man who had such a, a great image and commanded such power in the community could commit offences of this nature. He had a, a great deal of respect and following in the community. Lancashire Police started an investigation. After interviewing other parents and children, Ahmed Halalat was charged with three counts of indecent assault 
including an assault on another child. He denied the allegations. But it wasn't the first time Halilat had been in trouble with his congregation. In 1992, he was accused of abusing a child at a mosque in London. When the family decided not to press charges, Halilat moved on to Preston. Subsequent employers at the Kent Street Mosque were probably not aware of his past. As the Preston investigation continued, the parents began to get visits from people associated with the mosque. They said the case would bring shame on the mosque and the local community. They actually came to our house and they would take off their hats, put it at my feet and say, don't take it any further, he'll get a bad name. The mosque will get a bad name. But I said, no way. After what he did, they expect us to keep quiet. The regular visitors began to offer money, holidays to Pakistan and other inducements to leave Preston. When they refused, the bribes turned to threats. It was very difficult. The family were, were isolated. They were targeted by members of the community in so much that bribes were offered. Um, they were asked to drop the case. They were asked to drop the complaints and say that the, the girls were lying. When we used to walk along the streets, they would look at us as if we were the ones that did wrong, as if we're dirty or something, but we didn't do anything wrong. People spat at us when we went out. People spat at my daughter when she went to the shops. Just in case anything happened, the police gave me a machine. They told me if I pressed the button, they would come out immediately. On this particular day, I was walking along the road and a car came right up beside me on the pavement. The driver had a gun that was wrapped in a newspaper. He took it out and said, if you go to court, I'll shoot you. At the Crown Court, Halalat was supported by the committee that appointed him at the Kent Street Mosque. Whilst the family found themselves more and more isolated. There were members of the community that came to the trial at court that were there to support Halalat and throughout the whole of the investigation it was felt that there was a great deal of support for him and very little respect or support for the actual victims and their family. Ahmed Halalat pleaded not guilty. Two of the charges could not be proven due to lack of forensic evidence, but on the third offence, Traces of Halalat semen had been found on the carpet in the mosque classroom. This was enough to convict him on one of three counts of indecent assault. He received a six-month sentence and was placed on the sex offenders register. Four years on, the family is still finding life in their hometown difficult. Since 97, we're still getting harassment. We're getting threats, phone calls. People have come round to our house and threatened us on the streets. Would you put your children through it again? Never. Never again. Ahmed Halilat was released from prison after three months. But the police became alarmed when they found out that he'd returned to the Kent Street Mosque. The mosque have assured us that he's not teaching in any capacity at that mosque and doesn't have any access to children. Um, they have told us as well that when he visits that mosque, he's visiting at times outside of when the children are there. Halalat has also started attending other mosques in Lancashire. In nearby Bolton, our researcher attended evening prayers at the Al Falah Mosque. I was told by the senior imam that Halalat often led prayers there. We also found Halalat attending the Ashrafia Mosque a few hundred meters down the road. The Al Falah Mosque Committee have told us they're aware of Halalat's conviction. They said that he doesn't lead prayers regularly, but is occasionally entitled to do so. One of the real worries with someone like Mr. Halalat is that he can move from mosque to mosque to mosque 
and effectively go undetected. That presents a very big problem. Um, he does have a duty to register his address with us, but obviously if he moves to a different area, once he notifies the police in that area, he can network into local mosques, he can network back into people's homes, and he can ingratiate himself back into that community. The case of Ahmed Halala not only highlights the vulnerability of young children, but an absence of accountability in some of Britain's mosques. It's the most graphic example of how these places of worship are in need of reform. Every child has the right to be protected. Every child has the right to, to learn in a secure environment. And, and the mosque community has to provide their security. Because if they don't, they will face legal consequences. For a growing number of Muslims, there have been too many Abu Hamzas, too many Ahmed Halalats, too many congregations misled by their Imams. We need the protection of the law. And anyone saying to you that this interference in our own affairs is really talking nonsense. That should always apply to all, to all people living in Britain, including the Muslims, and to all institutions, including the mosques. Like all organized religions in Britain, Islam is having to face up to the needs of its worshippers. They're beginning to demand mosques that are safe, democratic, and above all, open to scrutiny.